Health warning. Um, the title of this is Libya in Transitions, Options for the Future. If you want to know about Libya, go to sleep now, because I'm not going to tell you very much about Libya. These guys are. I'm going to talk about options for the future. If you're interested in where is intervention going, the next 15 or so minutes, maybe a little bit longer, um, may be interesting to you. Uh, my colleagues here are experts in Libya. I'm not, and I don't pretend to be. Uh, but I do think Libya tells us about where we're going. We started off um, with somebody saying, um, Libya changes the way we think, and I want to see if I can challenge the way we think. Because I think intervention in the future is going to be wholly different from intervention in the past. By the way, um, if you come to these things, you might just as well do a plug for your book. Uh, my view of conventional intervention is well laid out in the book, still available at all the best booksellers in London, I feel certain, called uh, Swords and Plowshares, which I wrote when I came back from Bosnia. Uh, the big thing about the world which we're now going into is this, guys. For us in the West, certainly, that um, if you think the world is changing and has changed, you ain't seen nothing yet. Everything is about fundamentally to change, and that includes the practice of intervention. And I want to talk about some of those issues. Um, the big problem is always for generals, and I guess for interveners as well, is that you nearly always run the immediate next intervention on the, ba on the basis of the immediate past one. And I don't think that's going to fit. I don't think that's going to suit. By the way, we didn't do that in Libya for all sorts of inchoate and rather untidy reasons. We sort of stumbled on what I think was the right solution and maybe part of the model about how we address this in the future. So here is what I think is going to drive that process of change. Uh, in relation to interventions of the sort we did in Libya. The first is that we see, I mean, you know, this is so much a truism, it's hardly worth saying, an immense power shift taking place in the world, moving away from the dominance, a 400-year dominance, of the nations gathered broadly around the shores of the Mediterranean and latterly the shores of the Atlantic. Um, and by the way, whenever power shifts in the world, it always, it, it always ushers in a period of profound turbulence and usually blood. If you think about the last power shift that took place in the world, it was the power shift that occurred when power passed from the old nations of Europe to the new nation on the other side of the Atlantic, the United States, the beginning of the American century. And into the vacuum where the old powers were, the great bloody turbulences of the 20th century uh, came, the First and the Second World War, and all the little wars that were all about that power shift occurring. Uh, I think we are condemned to live at one of those times. In fact, we are condemned to live in an even more frightening power shift than we have seen. In the last 400 years, arguably since the end of the Ottoman Empire, um, the power shifts that have occurred have occurred within the Atlantic Mediterranean powers. They have been occurred from one power to another who shared the same values. Increasingly now, we're going to see a power shift to those areas of the world which do not necessarily share our values. The comfortable factor which we've enjoyed in the past of having allies with whom we shared values is going to be a comfort and a luxury we will not be able to afford in the future. My view is that the United States will remain the most powerful nation on Earth uh, for the next 10 years. But the context in which she holds her power is fundamentally altered. And they understand that rather better, I think, than we do in Europe. We are moving from 50 years, 50 rather unusual years. This is not the normal structure of the world, if you look back in history, of a monopolar world dominated by a single superpower. Wherever you were, the compass needles had to point to Washington for or against. Washington defined your position in the world. I think what you're now seeing is a wholly different structure, a multipolar world, um, a world much more like Europe in the 19th century. Do you remember Castlereagh, if you, anybody here remembers the great Foreign Secretary Castlereagh, who once called it the European Concert of Powers. And you had not fixed alliances, but shifting alliances. Britain had a common aim, but didn't have uh, common allies. It shift, if, if Berlin got together with Paris, we got together with Vienna and Rome, a period of shifting alliances. And if you move from a monopolar world to a multipolar world, then you move away from what we have enjoyed or not enjoyed, as you, according to your viewpoint, of a fixed alliance. You know, for the last 50 years, the single fixed alliance that we have exercised power in the world has been NATO. I personally think NATO and the Atlantic Alliance will remain our most important alliance, but it will not be the only one. 
Increasingly, we will have to do deals with others to get things done that we want done in the world. For those interested in intervention, see if you could answer this question. How many Chinese troops today serving under the blue flag, under the blue, under United Nations uh, control, under United Nations command in the world? Anybody know the answer here? You ought to. The answer is 3,700 in the D Democratic Republic of the Congo, committed to multilateral action. By the way, how many Americans, anybody know? 11. How many Brits? I think the right answer is two, but I'm not sure. What is the largest fleet now operating against the Somali pirates uh, in, the, uh, in the seas off Aden? Of course, you're ahead of me, aren't you? It's the Chinese. No, it's the Chinese Navy. The Chinese are the largest fleet uh, presence there. Why? Because they want to keep the sea lanes open. Of course they do. They're a mercantilist power. They want trade for just the same reason as we did. Now, you know, do we want multilateral actions to help the Congo? Yes, we do. In which case, the Chinese are our allies in that short-term aim. Not necessarily allies of permanence, not necessarily allies of who share our values. If you want to fight the, Chi the Somali pirates to keep the sea lanes open, the Chinese are one of our partners. When we did the uh, report I did for the government on humanitarian emergency review, we said we had to extend the multilateral framework beyond the Western powers. And the hard reality for us, I think, and this is where it bears in so strongly, is that if you want to get things done in the world, then you are going to have to look beyond the comfortable comfort of your Western club in order to get things done. When we tackled the world financial crisis, it was no longer good enough for the West just to do it by itself, as we did after the Second World War and creating the Bretton Woods institutions. We had to reach out to those new powers. And this has a fundamental change uh, impact on the way we think. My guess is Iraq and Afghanistan are the last time when the West tried to do it by itself. And by the way, we haven't succeeded. We are going to have to build alliances in the future to get things done which go beyond our Western partners. And that'll mean sometimes you can't do it. That'll mean that, for instance, in Syria, you can't do it because you can't build that kind of alliance. The most significant thing to me is that because of that shift in power, because of the relative decline of the Atlantic powers, if you want to call it, we could not, as we did in Iraq, have a cavalier disregard for international law in Libya. We had to get that international uh, imprimatur on our actions through the UN Security Council. My guess is that we will never again seek to intervene in a state unless we have a proper uh, and, and, and codified agreement under international law to do so. Partly because we won't have the power and partly because our own populations will not allow another exercise in that kind of military adventurism from which we have got, not succeeded. So get used to the idea that what happened in Libya, first of all, it was subject to UN Security Council resolution. And secondly, and crucially in Libya, the Western powers were not enough. If we had not bought in the Arab nations, albeit in small proportions, I don't think that intervention would have been possible. And increasingly elsewhere in the world, and I was lecturing to the British Army yesterday in Shrivenham, and I said to them, if you really want to know what's, who's going to be on your left wing, start discovering what the Chinese are doing in Africa, how they are practicing. They're the people with whom you may well have to connect. And if you can't bring them on board, either actively or at least passively, as happened in Libya, then you probably can't do it. A fundamental shift in the way that we think. Up until now, for the last 400 years, if the West got its act together, it could propose and dispose in every corner of the world. In future, that isn't going to be the case, and Libya is a pointer to that. Second point I want to make to you is the second driver for this phenomenal change, which is the interdependence. We now live in an extraordinarily, massively interdependent world, a world which is interconnected in the way that it never has been before. Well, the interdependence of nations, I suppose you might argue, um, has always been there. Diplomacy is about managing the interdependence of nations. But now we are deeply interdependent, both externally and internally, in ways that have never been true before, interlinked in ways that have never been true before. The nation state cannot any longer exist as a nation state. It has to exist within that network of linkages. You get, uh, you know, you get swine flu in, in Mexico, it's a problem for Heathrow the day, the day after. You get fires on the Russian steppes, food riots in Africa. Um, Lehman Brothers goes down, the whole bloody thing collapses. We are now interconnected, and that's a profoundly important fact. It's an important fact in two areas. The first is the way we structure ourselves. 
You know, if you'd have asked me as a young soldier in the 1960s, um, talk about the defense of Britain, I'd have talked about the size of our army, the size of our air, uh, uh, Navy, the size of our Air Force, and the effectiveness of our allies. Now, if I want to talk about the security of Britain, I have to bring in the Minister of Health, because pandemic disease is a threat to our security. I have to bring in the Minister of Agriculture, because food security, watch this space, going to be a big issue, is part of the security of our country. I have to bring in the Minister of Industry, because, because the fragility of our cyber networks, infrastructures, are now a point of attack for our enemies. I have to bring, so said to me when I was a soldier in Borneo, the Home Office is going to be involved in the security of Britain, I thought it was rubbish. But we now know the Home Office is involved, because what happens in that immigrant, second generation immigrant family in Bolton can affect our security, as we saw in London. So it's not just the defense of Britain, is not just, the security of Britain is not just a matter for the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And your capacity to be able to secure that actually means that it's the network that matters. It's your ability to work together across the piece. And if ever there was an example of how we failed to do that, look at Whitehall. Whitehall, constructed after the defeat of the Boer War, was constructed by, by the way, the Haldane Committees, and it was constructed in the image of the, the structures of the Industrial Revolution. Vertical hierarchies, vertical structures, commands, uh, structures, specialization of tasks. They don't know how to network. Actually, the screaming of gears you hear in Whitehall today is vertical structures and vertically structured minds, knowing they ought to network, but not having a clue how to do it. If you look at the modern structure of industry, they've understood this, flat networks, the ability to network. And if you have a look at our failures in Afghanistan in intervention, it's because we couldn't work together effectively, either within our own structures or indeed between the nations who were intervening. When I was in Bosnia, bringing the international community together, getting it to speak for a sing with a single voice, getting it to work together effectively to achieve our aims on a network basis was crucial. And where we fail, we fail in chief measure because of that. Actually, Ashdown's third law, don't ask for Ashdown's first law or Ashdown's second law, because there isn't one. It always sounds better if there's a third law. <laughs> Ashdown's third law, and my God it applies in intervention, is this, that in the modern age, the most important part of what you can do is what you can do with others. Actually, in a modern network, in a modern structure, the most important thing are your interconnectors, your docking points, your ability to work across the piece, your network, rather than to operate um, as sort of separate vertical structures. And if the international community is serious about intervention, then it had better start thinking about how it does that much more effectively. The intervention unit in Whitehall is a funny little orphan pimple stuck off, separated from almost everybody, and acting, it seems to me, chiefly as a reservoir of expert expertise that can be sent across. Does it act actually act as the catalyst to make that network work? No, it doesn't, and it certainly ought to, and that needs to come from the top. So second point I want to make, and by the way, it isn't just that. I mean, <coughs> just imagine Afghanistan. Just imagine Lord Roberts of Kandahar. Just imagine what he would have said to you about the winning of the Second Afghan War. He wouldn't have talked about poppies because they were irrelevant. Now poppies are connected to every single city in our country and the level of crimes in our country. Everything is connected to everything. He wouldn't have talked about a mad mullah in a cave. There was one, by the way. His name was the Akond of Swat. Uh, and Edward Lear wrote a, wrote a nonsense poem saying, Who or what is the Akond of Swat? Is he short? Is he small? Is he fat? Or is he squat? The Akond of No one would say who or what is Osama bin Laden. And the reason is because the Akond of Swat was connected to nobody. But Osama bin Laden is directly connected to that person in that terraced house in Bolton. Everything is connected to everything. You know, old Lord Roberts of Kandahar did a lot of what we now call collateral damage, but nobody what bothered about it. Gladstone made a great speech about it, but you didn't hear about it until six months later. Now the collateral damage caused by that inadvertent piece of American hardware um, falling on a wedding party is flashed across the nation, the world, a moment later, and matters very much. Everything is connected to everything, and unless you understand that, you <laughs> cannot intervene effectively. My last point, um, I don't want to run too far beyond my time, is the third driver, which I think is this. It is the globalization of power. You see, there's a power shift that's taken place laterally, but also a power shift that's taken place vertically. 
a huge amount of the power that was locked within the nation state, subject to its laws and subject to its rules of accountability, is now swilling around on the global stage, which is largely lawless and does not have systems of accountability. And you see the effects of that. You see it in the financial crisis, where the I huge international money go round, now circulating some 50 times the amount of money necessary to drive the trade processes, got out of control because no one could control it. There are lots of things that live in that space, the internet, the satellite broadcasters, good things that we want like international trade, but bad things too, because lawless spaces get occupied by the destroyers. And the revelation of 9-11 is that the destroyers of our society can use that space too. It follows to me, ladies and gentlemen, that if the globalization of un unconstrained uh, and n not legally constrained and unaccountable power is one of the phenomena of our time, and indeed one of the great destabilizers, then one of, the, uh, one of the jobs we have to do, one of our challenges, is to begin to create governance in the global space. And that means that you have to begin to create, for instance, the institutions of international law. That's one of them. The G20 struggling at present to create governance in the financial space. But be aware of this, that when you create law, it's going to be messy. It's, you know, Bismarck once said, Bismarck <laughs> said that if you love sausages and, re and respect the law, take care to watch neither of them being made. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, I can watch that daily proved in the House of Commons. But it's also true about international law. It isn't easy. We're going to make mistakes. It's going to be inelegant. Be patient. It'll take time to construct. But it's absolutely essential. And that's why we see, for instance, some of the untidiness in, in Libya. I mean, here's my last point. If you are now going to, in, my, my guess is, I mean, there, are th sorry, there are three answers to the present condition um, of a turbulent world. One is, we, can, we can't do this, we can't intervene, we made such a screw up of it in Iraq and Afghanistan, it looks horribly untidy in Libya, therefore let's mother, not bother. In an interdependent world, a world of great turbulence, if you say that intervening in the domestic jurisdiction of another state in order to preserve the wider peace is something you are not going to attempt, the world is going to be much more turbulent, much more difficult, much more destructive, and much more bloody. So that leaves you two options if you want to intervene. In, option number one is Iraq, Afghanistan, the model. We do it. We win the war ourselves with our hardware and our troops. We create the peace, largely in our own uh, image, even though it may not apply to sh ship, lock, stock, and barrel um, a Western-style democracy into a country like Iraq or Afghanistan and kill people if they don't want it. Um, and that makes success? Not exactly. It's been a hell of a mess. Or we do it a la Libya. I don't say we thought this through, but we stumbled on the mechanism by which we said, we won't do it, but we will enable them to do it. And then we enable them to construct the peace in the image they want. Bit of a mess? Sure. I don't, argue, I don't think it's a worse mess than we saw in Iraq or see now in Afghanistan. Is it untidy? You bet. Have they set themselves two ambitious tasks, the, the NTC, to be able to get through this process? Yeah, but you don't have to go to Libya to find people setting themselves over ambitious tasks. We did exactly the same in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's why I think, that's why I think that in many ways, Libya, done under international law, a coalition wider, not much wider, but wider than the, than the Atlantic powers, and as it were, intervention to enable, rather than intervention to do yourselves, is not a bad model for us to be proceeding from. And it strikes me that if I was given a choice to shall we do another Iraq or Afghanistan, by the way, I think beyond our capabilities anyway, not least because of the cuts in defense budgets, or shall we do it, try and build on the model of Libya, I think the second of those makes a better option. I have to address one final question before finishing, which is, OK, so we do it in Libya. Why don't we do it in Syria? Well, here's my answer. Actually, where I think we've come to now both legally when it comes to intervention. By the way, I think the UN will increasingly become not a doer, but a legitimizer, a subcontractor of action in non-permissive circumstances to those who can do, largely the professional military and other organizations. But actually where we've got to in international practice and law is that there are six criteria when you intervene and intervene both legally and appropriately. And by the way, if you want to draw a comparison with the criteria of Thomas Aquinas for the just war, they bear a very close resemblance. 
You intervene when all these conditions are in place. One, there is an egregious breach of the law, international law, one sort or another. Two, if responsibility to protect becomes an operative system, and Israel has cert I mean, <laughs> Libya has certainly laid the premise for that, the precedent for that, you can ignore this. But the second one is that the effect of the breach of that law is, is to affect the wider peace. It isn't just confined to the country, but it affects the peace of the region, the peace of the world. Weapons of mass destruction, floods of refugees, and so on. And three, you have exhausted all other means, all diplomatic means. And four, the means by which you intervene is proportionate to what you are trying to create, so nuclear weapons, out. And five, it is legal. That's the fifth Aquinas law, and I think it becomes, in, in fact, de facto, a law for us too. And six, and let me warn you, this will offend you, because this moves from the objective and easily supportable to the subjective and a matter of judgment. But it's there in Aquinas. And six, there is a reasonable prospect of success. Aquinas is very clear. He says, you, if you go to war and there's not a prospect of success, it is needlessly to waste life. In more political terms, nowadays, what prime minister, what president would commit their young people to go to war where it wasn't a prospect of success? So Libya, we can do. Syria, under present circumstances, or I have to say, almost any circumstances that I can perceive, we can't do, because there isn't a prospect of success. Does that mean that China will block you here and there? Yes, they will, or Russia, or whatever, will cast vetoes to block you? Yes, they will. Um, but, and here I do genuinely finish, um, but here's the point. <coughs> Just because you can't do it everywhere doesn't mean to say you can't do it anywhere. Making those difficult judgments about where it's possible to do it is the right thing to do. Simply throwing up your hands in the air and saying, we can't do this because we can't do it everywhere is the wrong thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paddy.